all very much for being here. And a very special thanks to the Brown team, headed by Vanessa Ryan, uh, for organizing this uh, unique and, I think, landmark event. If you were a consultant in marketing, you would probably want to say to American higher education that you have a problem with your value proposition. <laughs> Tuitions are soaring in public institutions, and they already have reached very painful levels in private ones. Governments at both the federal and state level are increasingly trying to find ways in which to measure the value of education. One of the latest forms of that is to do surveys and analytical studies of the average starting salaries that young graduates have on leaving college. The results often, so far, have been somewhat anomalous. Complex connections are hard to make. They're obviously partial, and they're misleading. But the tendency in the public mind to identify education with its market value is taking hold at a deep level. Some of this, I think, I can illustrate for you in a, a little anecdote. About a month ago, I saw a magazine article with a very provocative title that said, what are you worth? When I looked at it, I said, I'm going to get that magazine because it must be about life's purposes. And I could, I could use a little existential reassurance. <laughs> so I opened the magazine to find, in fact, it was about the metrics of evaluating investments. What are you worth? The same words used in radically different contexts and we begin to see something of the challenge of understanding the worth of education. But we have some resources to turn to to think about connecting those meanings or at least clarifying them. And one of the ones that I often find helpful is a quote that comes from Thomas Green, written some years ago, who said, we are born into the world, but we are educated into the possession of our human powers. Our powers for the exercise of intellect, judgment, imagination, action, observation, one might add language. And he goes on then to say that the defining characteristic of educational value, its central presence, is in fact the development of human powers. Now it happens that that very broad idea of the development of powers has been picked up in higher education today as institutions in fact are struggling with the wider perception of value and have to in effect always nowadays try to evaluate, and the word on campus is often assess what they're doing. And in that process of that movement, there have been some interesting, I think, on the whole, positive directions, because much of the community in higher education has come to terms with the fact that there are what are often called essential student learning outcomes. The term outcomes, I don't, particularly love, but it suggests for us that there are deep qualities and characteristics of thinking and judgment and social and personal responsibility that arise out of the study in the arts and sciences. Just a quick uh, rehearsal of how that seems to happen. We immerse ourselves in the study of the arts and sciences, paying particular attention, obviously, to the specific languages in each discipline and field. But as we do that, uh, we are also engaging with processes and methods that have wider application than just that discipline. So indeed, 
content is critical. You have to study the texts. You have to find the ways to use the data. You have to unpack the, the experiment. You need to develop ways of communicating in that field about it. But over the course of an undergraduate education and after, that knowledge and its processes comes to take up place in the students and adults moving toward intellectual autonomy, thinking for oneself, and also the process of becoming an agent of one's own life. So the content fuses with a broad development process, and we often now hear and read about the kinds of deposits, if you will, that seem to come out of that complex developmental and intellectual process. So many associations and organizations call attention to what we call uh, these powers of mind, these human capabilities, such as effective communication, critical thinking, complex reasoning, quantitative reasoning, integrative thinking, and creativity, and the feeling for one's responsibility in the world. Now, it would be fun if we had some time to go through some of those big abstractions and pull more of the meaning out of them, and I'll do that just very quickly with one or two. I'm particularly enchanted in the work that I've done in different contexts with the power of language. And in various roles that I've held, I've discovered that getting in, if you will, effective communication means many things. It means, first of all, loving the word, immersing yourself in the power of that language, often feeling its beauty uh, and its significance and its nuance. But then as a public person, it often falls to someone, sometimes I've had to do this, to serve as the leader of an organization trying to communicate widely a direction for that institution. And to do that, language becomes your critical medium of uh, effectiveness. And it starts not just by speaking, but by listening. Listening is an art of language. And as you listen, you listen for narrative. You try to find the sequences of significant human meaning in every organization in which you find yourself and you attend to what the participants hold dear. And as you communicate, you look to resonate with that significance. Sometimes you make it and hit it. Sometimes you miss it. Often you clarify what may be said. You sort out the language. But you take some degree of significant influence in the conversation if you can clarify it, elevate it, but give it back. And then it's given back again. Now, let me illustrate with Brown's story. As a sophomore here, I took a course on 17th century French literature. I was not a, a literature major, I was a history major. But I was thinking I might want to go study in France for a junior year, and so I had a little background and I took the course. And there I was, a graduate of Hingham High School, some 60 miles away, uh, no particular background in that level of French. And there I am reading Racine, Corneille, Madame de la Fontaine, Molière. And I'm suddenly immersed in this dramatic, almost excessive, explosive language that the 17th century dramatists are using. Corneille in Lucide, Orage, au désespoir, au vieillesse ennemi. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> but what I'm learning in the process that I think has really affected the ways in which I often, for certain contexts, try to do some writing, is the effect of the rhythm, the power of language, if you find the right form of communication to carry within it its own capacity for touching others. And so from the most unlikely places, one finds that kind of resource for a lifetime. Unpredictable, but real. 
I could give other illustrations, and I will quickly. We talk endlessly about critical thinking as a power that we try to develop. And of course, that's a broad abstraction, so you need to get into the specifics. What it particularly means is that we learn how to use evidence to apply in a variety of different circumstances. And among academic people and among people in the general public, it is not difficult to come back to the question, well, where's your evidence for that? I can talk to a chemist as a professor of religion and have a good conversation talking about different forms of evidence to be sure, but sometimes some stunning parallels in the way in which uh, these different fields operate. So we all know about evidence. We also know about assumptions. And finding often the piercing place to go in an argument is to find just exactly what it's based on. On several occasions, I've served on committees that have hired people for high-level responsibilities in public and private operations, cor corporations and charities. And I have been stunned on more than one occasion about how all of the characteristics that we enumerate, such as critical thinking of problem solving, using language effectively, relating to others effectively, a sense of social responsibility, integrity, all the things we talk about in liberal education are exactly what we're looking for when we're trying to find the right person to step into a position of leadership. It's transcending from the point of a technical specialty into a broader set of responsibilities where the critical rub often comes. Will the accountant, who has a wonderful achievement as an accountant, be able to move to the next level and become a general manager? Will the engineer be able to move to China and have the background in understanding a different culture, know something about the economics of a very different society, relate to people with entirely different backgrounds? Those are our questions. And when the psychometricians join us, what they often suggest to us is that it is complex reasoning capabilities, critical thinking that rises in this world to the top of the list of what will be a pointer toward effectiveness. But you know, all of these benefits from liberal education don't just happen by themselves in abstraction. What I mean by that is there's a how to it. There's a what content, there's a consequence, these broad powers of thinking, there's a how. And in today's educational world, and certainly at Brown, one of the hows is the ways in which students deeply immerse themselves in the practice of education, in becoming engaged participants in forms of learning. So from projects from day one in which students are preparing work uh, of their own and submitting it, when they're doing a great deal of writing, when they're involved in research with a faculty member, when they are uh, engaged in a student service project uh, in the community, when they are developing presentations with their teammates that they then bring to class, when they're traveling the world and learning uh, about different cultures and knowing different languages, it's in an inventive period for American education that the uses of technology surround and undergird much of that kind of movement. But there is another how I would like to talk about that I think, although not specific to Brown, uh, identifies Brown. When I came to Brown University, I had the ambition that I wanted to be a high school history teacher. And that was because I was good at remembering, remembering dates. I learned quickly that that was not much what history had to do with when you studied it at Brown. But I also learned that people looked to my work and found something in it that had some kind of ability to move from a kind of dutiful, rather dull compliance with memorization to maybe a spark that could be set on fire. And so I began to notice that, number one, my friends changed my sophomore year and suddenly I spent more time with students who took ideas seriously uh, than drinking beer in the fraternity basement. That was okay too, but <laughs> I can say the ideas began to take a grip and I saw myself then as getting on fire with learning. 
And then as time moved on, I noticed that professors would make gestures of community that affirmed my place in it. So sophomore year, Professor Crary, who was chairman of the history of the religion department, wrote me a note after an exam and said, and it wasn't a great exam, it was an exam. He wrote and said, you know, there are some nice things in your exam. Come by and talk to me about your future. And he said, you know, if you want to study religion, you probably have some capability. You should look at, you know, going on for three years to a, you know, a school of religion to study religion, like a Yale or someplace. And then after that, you'd go on for another three years. And I said, did you say six years? And I said, oh, that's great. I'm going to think I'll stay a history major. As it turned out, I did what he said. But I can also suggest that that kind of interaction was summarized at the point uh, when Wendell Dietrich, in my senior year, helped me with an independent study project studying the human condition in Karl Barth and Reinhold Niebuhr. And he scribbled in the margins you can think theologically with considerable power. I was hooked. I was a member of the community. I had arrived, and I went on to, to earn my advanced degrees in religion, and that, of course, is what I've taught for much of my career until I was sidelined doing a lot of administrative work. But the point in all of what this adds to is that at Brown and in the creation of the intellectual power of the experience where these capabilities take hold. It is participation, it's acts of recognition, it is the friendships that have the power to drive the capabilities. Now these capabilities, I want to suggest, are not something that are limited to those who uh, are an intellectual elite and follow the path of liberal education. These are things that should, in fact, be happening in the study of professional programs, of vocational programs, woven into the program at whatever level. One of the disturbing things about the equivalence of starting salaries and the value of an education, they're related but they're not equivalent, is to see the, the extent to which that identification has been made. Finally, liberal education is the way in which we can develop our capabilities so as to join with the capabilities of others in creating a society which provides much richer opportunity and satisfaction for all. Thank you.